Hello, I'm Sharon Rulier here at beautiful Forest Park in Springfield, located on the banks of the Connecticut River on 735 acres of land. It's one of the largest municipal parks in the country. All year round, you can certainly find something to do here. And in the summer, it's especially beautiful with all of the roses in bloom. I hope you're enjoying your summer so far. Today we continue our tradition of bringing you some of our favorite episodes that have aired during the year. Our program today first aired on April 19th. Coming up on this edition of Real to Real, we revisit Jerusalem, the place where Holy Week began. I'm Terry Hegarty. I'll be recalling the Boston Marathon bombings one year later, and I'll introduce you to two local therapy dogs who help people recover from emotional scars caused by trauma. And in duet with God, one local musician's love of music and faith. These stories and more are just ahead on this edition of Real to Real from Mark Henry's in Indian Orchard. From throughout Western New England and beyond, this is Real to Real, your window on the world around you. Here is your Real to Real host, Sharon Rulier. Hello and welcome again to Real to Real on this Easter weekend. We come to you from Mark Henry Florist in the Indian Orchard section of Springfield, where the beauty of spring is definitely surrounding us today. As we celebrate this holiest of Christian days, we are reminded of the time that Christ spent in Jerusalem. Last year, we had Terry Hegarty preparing a very special segment for Holy Week using footage that was shot in Jerusalem as part of his trip to the Holy Land in 2012. The diocesan pilgrimage hosted more than two dozen pilgrims as they visited some of the holiest sites in the world. We hope you enjoy this encore presentation from Jerusalem that retraces the final steps of Jesus' life on earth. Here's Terry's report. As Holy Week begins, the pilgrims from the Diocese of Springfield who visited the Holy Land last fall will surely have a new appreciation of these holy days leading up to Easter. They've walked the streets that Jesus walked on his last days. They've been to the actual sites where Jesus triumphantly entered Jerusalem, and they've seen where his suffering took place. Pilgrims began on the Mount of Olives that rises to the east of the city of Jerusalem. And the Lord Jesus was very active during the day, preaching, teaching. Olive trees are still abundant on this land, and even those harvesting the olives are still plentiful. Father Gary Daly, the spiritual leader of the pilgrimage, says there were several stops on the tour that impressed him. To be in the places where Jesus was and where his final moments here were uh, during that week of the Passion and leading up to the Resurrection. So uh, overall it was just a, a, a wonderful, wonderful experience. While descending the Mount of Olives, pilgrims enjoyed a panoramic view of the old city. They continued down the mountain along the pathway that Jesus Lots used as he rode a borrowed donkey into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. Keep going. Halfway down, they arrived at Dominus Flavit, where Jesus wept over the holy city. He foresaw the wounds that not only would be inflicted upon him, but upon the city. Thirty years after Jesus' death, the Romans left Jerusalem in ruins. Going back in history so far, and to be on the Mount of Olives, to be on the road where he rode the donkey into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, really means a lot. Just nearby still stands the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus' passion began. Here he wept and prayed as he spent one last night with his apostles. The people of Caiaphas went down here with torches and swords, like they went to capture a thief. And they said, Jesus of Nazareth, where are you? And the Lord stood here and he said, I am he. 
Next, the group entered the old city. They then embarked upon the Way of Sorrows. Of all the places in the Holy Land, walking the Via Della Rosa, or the Way of the Cross, is probably the closest thing to walking in the footsteps of Jesus. Here, he carried his own cross to his crucifixion. Many participants say that the experience has helped them to better understand the suffering of Jesus. When we are going up the Via Della Rosa, both her and I were struggling going up, but I'm saying to myself, Jesus suffered a heck of a lot more than we did, even though mm -hmm. I was struggling going up. Yeah. <laughs> I was saying the same thing to myself. I was in so much pain, but I kept saying to myself, I've got to push through because Christ suffered far more than I'm suffering, and he did it. The stations wind their way through the streets of the old city with plenty of steps and plenty of merchants. The prayerful piety that one may enjoy while participating in the Stations of the Cross in their church is not present here. The ninth station is just outside of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the holiest place in the world for Christians. The gray domed structure has been built over the spots where it is believed that Jesus was crucified, died, was buried, and rose from the dead. The last five stations of the cross are within the church. Just inside the main doorway, pilgrims can venerate the stone of anointing where Jesus' body was prepared for burial. One of the other places that had significant meaning for me was uh, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, uh, the Church of the Resurrection. Uh, to be there in the place of Golgotha, where Jesus died, where he shed his blood for us, uh, and then where he was buried and where he resurrected, just had significant meaning for me. That was a very moving experience, walking the Via Dolorosa, the way of sorrow, sorrow and cross, up the steps through an Arab commercial area, stopping at the various stations of the cross, uh, much like the ones we have in our churches, except this was a, a living experience, uh, culminating in the Holy Sepulchre. A 19th century edicule has been built around what remains of the tomb of Jesus. Faithful wait in line, sometimes for hours, to enter and touch the shelf that was in the cave where the body of Jesus was placed. The thing that I enjoyed most was the mental and the emotional experience you feel when you visit the various sites. And I think, you know, like some of the other things that really bring out, you know, the sadness and looking at, you know, the tomb, and then taking that and walking to where he was crucified. You then, you know, you feel that. You can really feel that. I think that's the basis of strengthening your face. A strengthening that will likely last for many years to come for participants, deepening their understanding of the passion of the Lord and their joy throughout the Easter season. Reporting for Real to Real, this is Terry Hegarty. That definitely looks like it was a memorable and inspiring pilgrimage. And still to come on Real to Real, the Boston Marathon bombings one year later. And in duet with God. These stories and more are still to come on this special summer edition of Real to Real. The Chalice of Salvation, your weekly spiritual connection. I'm Passionist Brother Terrence Scanlon, inviting you to take time out of your summer days and join us Sunday morning at 10. This week, we welcome Father Robert White from Our Lady of Mount Carmel Parish and introduce you to the CEO of EWTN, Cathedral alum Michael Warsaw. The Chalice of Salvation, your spiritual connection, Sunday morning at 10, right here on 22 News. I'm Dan Dumas with your Real to Real News Brief. Well, we have some stories that we didn't have time to share with you in June, starting with some fast feet for good causes. Carolee McGrath shares the story of the St. Michael Academy 5K fundraise. 
Parents, teachers, and students from St. Michael's Academy in Springfield met up on a recent Saturday morning to raise money for the school's tuition assistance program. St. Michael's held the first annual 5K road race at Forest Park in Springfield. The kids kicked off the event with a fun run. Diane Laporte is a computer teacher at St. Michael's. We decided to hold a 5K run walk to um, raise money for our tuition assistance program to help families who are in our school um, uh, have money to pay tuition if it's, it's a you know if it's a need. Laporte says they raised more than $1,400 to help families send their children to St. Michael's, Springfield's only Catholic pre-K through grade eight school. Michelle and Donald Demore set up a separate 425 gifts challenge. The Demores donated $75,000 to match the $75,000 the school raised through pledges. The SMA fund helps to keep tuition as low as possible and to provide enriched academic and extracurricular programs. Okay, so, uh, Melissa Freeman is a guidance counselor at St. Michael's. Um, we thought it would be important because we wanted to get our community and our school involved in something that would provide um, like a healthy activity for our kids. Uh, I also feel like 5Ks in general bring people together and we also wanted to help our school come together to help people in our school with the tuition assistance program. Freeman and other parents gathered say Catholic education is invaluable. I think they teach the kids a lot of good morals and their work ethic is really strong because they're not teaching to a test. They're just teaching them to learn how to do well in life and succeed. Organizers hope to make this an annual event. I'm Carolee McGrath reporting. And others were also running to remember a fallen friend and classmate as the family of Connor Reynolds held a Memorial 5K. To honor the memory of a Cathedral High School student who was killed four years earlier, more than 200 participants gathered in Springfield's Forest Park recently for the Honor Connor Four Miler Race and Walk. Connor Reynolds, a 17-year-old Cathedral senior and star soccer player, was the victim of youth violence in March of 2010. Connor was murdered trying to break up a fight. Connor was always that way. He was, he was always defending the underdog. He was uh, hated bullying, so it's not surprising that he got involved in trying to break up the fight. Uh, the result is just the most tragic thing that ever happened to us, and a huge impact on the community also. And that community responded not only in the immediate aftermath of the tragedy, but ever since. Four years later and we still have uh, a lot of people uh, involved and uh, it's, we're growing and uh, it's a lot of fun to see all these people come out and support our organization. We're, we're thrilled about it. Honor Connor addresses the problem of youth violence by promoting participation in sports. The foundation funds scholarships to Cathedral High School and to colleges. Mark Hegarty, who won the race, finishing in 21 minutes, 23 seconds, is a 2012 Cathedral graduate. I'm here just to come out for Connor because I was a junior when everything happened and it like really took a toll on the whole school and community, so I wanted to be the one to come out here and, and win the, the first race ever, so for Connor. Megan Matthews Hegarty, a member of Cathedral's class of 2000, was the first woman finisher with a time of 25 minutes, 50 seconds. I think it's a really good cause to be out here for the Reynolds family and the Cathedral family. I know it's a, a cause close to our hearts. Race officials estimate that more than $6,000 was raised at the first of what they hope will be an annual event. And remember, throughout the summer, you can always stay informed on in all the happenings in our diocese by logging on to our news and information website, iobserve.org, where you'll find up to the minute and accurate news in the Catholic Church, both here in the Diocese of Springfield and beyond. You can also see video reports from Real to Real from the award-winning team at Catholic News Service. That's our news and information website, iobserve.org. I'm Dan Dumas, and that's your Real to Real News Brief. It's been just over a year since the Boston Marathon bombings shattered a festive, world-renowned Boston event, killing three and severely injuring dozens. Terry Hegarty traveled to Boston and reflects on the aftermath of the bombings. 
He also tells us about Father Bill Hamilton, a priest of the Diocese of Springfield who served as a chaplain to law enforcement officials in Boston a year ago, and who now, along with his therapy dog, Ted Ted, is helping people cope with the emotional stress associated with such trauma. It's been more than a year since terrorism struck one of Boston's most popular and beloved events. The Boston Marathon bombings and the frantic manhunt following left four dead and hundreds injured. The term Boston Strong, coined after two bombs went off near the finish line on Boylston Street, has symbolized the resilience of the people. For me, Boston Strong uh, means uh, sort of highlighting what America stands for, and that is not over, uh, not allowing fear to, de to determine how you should live or where you should go. Um, it's almost like a fight to keep yourself not in that mentality where you're kind of always paranoid, but um, to kind of um, overcome it but not forget. Mikhail says that this year's marathon will help people to overcome. I'm hoping people show up to show that, you know, um, that people have overcome the fear of something like that happening. That's very important. Not only have security measures here in Boston increased since the 2013 Boston Marathon bombings, so has the resolve of the people here. Area residents are now more determined than ever to stand against such violence. But taking a stand is only part of a healthy response. In addition to the physical tolls, the emotional injuries to many have been just as traumatic. Coping with the stress associated with such violence often requires the help of others. Last year, Real to Real traveled to Boston just after the bombings and interviewed Father Bill Hamilton, who was there serving in his role as chaplain for the Massachusetts State Police and the New England region of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. Over the last year, Father Bill has traveled to Boston and Watertown to help public safety personnel. We've been back and forth uh, to Watertown especially uh, with uh, providing uh, continued support. We went three months after the bombing, uh, six months, uh, and we'll be going back again now that we're coming up to the first anniversary. And sometimes help comes in the form of a furry, four-legged friend like Father Bill's St. Bernard, Ted Ted. Father Bill has owned the three-year-old dog for the last three months. Ted Ted serves as a therapy dog, comforting people when talking about things may be too much. You know, he walks in and everybody wants to pet him. Everybody, you know, he loves people, he loves the attention, uh, and he loves loving. You know, I said if I had to, to do over again, I didn't get to name him. Uh, I said I think I would have called him CJ for comfort and joy, because uh, when he comes in, it's all comfort and joy. Father Bill also serves as chaplain of the Greenfield Police Department and the East Hampton Police and Fire Departments. And while it may seem unusual to see a couple of 140-pound dogs wandering around a public safety complex, Ted Ted is a valued member of the Greenfield Police Department. He also occasionally gets to visit with Clarence, Greenfield Police Officer Laura Gordon's therapy dog. Officer Gordon brought Clarence to Newtown, Connecticut following the Sandy Hook Elementary School shootings. She says that often there are no words to comfort people. Yeah, when we were in Newtown, Connecticut, um, there was a lot of silence uh, at times. You know, you're correct, nobody wanted to talk or weren't ready to talk. Um, and what, again, was fascinating is the dogs could sense that. Is sometimes the families, victims, kids, um, they didn't want to talk to another person. Um, you know, it was easier to talk to a dog. The dog's not going to judge you for what you experience, how you experience, what you're feeling. Just as people are all different, and have their own personalities, so do the canines. And Ted Ted here has demonstrated a clear ability to help other people. Officer Gordon says not all dogs are well suited to this work, but that St. Bernard's were bred to help people caught in avalanches. They don't use them so much for the avalanches anymore, but we like to use them for our people that are kind of buried under an avalanche of anxiety. Father Bill says that this Monday's Boston Marathon will be a celebration and a triumph. People really want to be there. They want to come out. They're going to say, this is not going to stop us. We're bigger than this. We're stronger than this. We're more resilient than this. Father Bill is constantly impressed by the dedication and the bravery of public safety personnel. 
Uh, these people put their lives on the line every single day. Uh, and every time they go out of the house, they don't know if they're going to come home. And that's always in the back of their heads. You know, that's always in their minds. It's not talked about that much. Uh, but the idea is uh, it is a very dangerous job. A dangerous job that members of the general public are very grateful such brave individuals are willing to fill, with the help of a few <laughs> drooling, furry, and loving companions. Reporting for Real to Real, this is Terry Hegarty. With three diocesan priests recently retired and two new priests ordained in June, none of us needs to be a mathematician to conclude that nurturing vocations to the priesthood is vital for the future of the Springfield Diocese. But the July-August issue of the Catholic Mirror features some people, programs, and organizations that we hope will inspire all of us to work together to help our local church grow and thrive for generations to come. First among these stories is the introduction of Bishop Mitchell Thomas Rosansky, who will be installed on August 12th as the ninth Bishop of the Springfield Diocese. A special four-page report will highlight the new bishop's background and the warm reception he received on his first day in the diocese. The cover story celebrates our two newest priests, Fathers Frank Lawler and Christopher Federician, who followed radically different paths to the same place, serving God's people in the Springfield Diocese. In a special article for The Mirror, the Diocese's Director of Vocations, Father Gary Daly, notes some very specific ways we can nurture the seeds of religious vocations that God is still planting in the minds and hearts of men and women in our midst. There also is news of the participation of some of our priests in Good Leaders, Good Shepherds, a program that has already borne fruit in local parishes. In the town of Palmer, parishioners are celebrating 150 years of Catholic presence in their community. And a special interview with Catherine Wiley, founder of the International Catholic Grandparents Association, highlights the efforts of the eldest of our family members as they show us how much faith matters in the modern world. Finally, now retired, Bishop Timothy McDonnell reflects on his time as shepherd of the Springfield Diocese. So as we enjoy the beauty and bounty of summer, let us remember that we all are workers in God's garden, which yields the sweetest harvest of all, love, forgiveness, and eternal life. At the editor's desk, I'm Rebecca Drake. You are watching Real to Real, your window on the world around you. Here again is your Real to Real host, Sharon Rulier. And our final story today is a duet of sorts. It's a story of a lifelong friendship, one between music and a musician, a musician and her students, a pianist and her saint, all in duet with God. Jessica Romisher is an award-winning pianist, composer, writer, and teacher. Born into a musical family, she began playing piano at age six, always improvising and composing. I think that when spring starts to happen, it makes us realize that it really is a wonderful world. She graduated from Princeton, has taught on four continents, has interviewed Archbishop Desmond Tutu, and played for the governor. What Jessica is very well known for is her innovative work in music of piano duet improvisation. She makes it possible for everyone, regardless of age, background, or even the presence of a developmental disability, to be able to play music.
During an interview in her Berkshire home, Jessica told me her mother, also a gifted pianist, taught her what it really means to create great music. She would often say, I have no idea why people, concert pianists, play like it's five minutes to five and they're trying to catch a five o'clock bus. <laughs> because that's the thing she said, the space, you have to let the music breathe, you have to let the phrases unfold, you have to allow that space to be. And that is what she's given me. Jessica and I had a long conversation that day about life, growing up Jewish in Westchester, New York, her parents' divorce when she was a young child, and being raised by a nanny she refers to as her saint. She related this story during a concert at St. Agnes Church in Dalton. It took me 45 years to realize that I'd been raised by a saint. But as I look back, there were signs along the way. She came to care for me when I was eight, and when I was a young girl, I was soothed by her words of comfort. She's a devout Catholic, and when we were growing up, she would always go, for instance, into her room in the evening and pray her rosary. And we didn't really understand what she was doing, but the feeling of that prayer was a part of my life from the time that I was eight. For Jessica, faith and music have been intertwined throughout her life. I like being in, in a church, and this is kind of a special church for me because something kind of happened here for me that was really quite special. And so I'm going to kind of share with you today how a Jewish girl from Westchester ends up in a Catholic church in Dalton, Mass. Jessica told me that it was her relationship with her nanny, Flora, whom she also refers to as her other mother, that eventually led her to the Catholic church. She was baptized two years ago at St. Agnes. And I started to feel that same sense of connection that she had. So for me, baptism was like a continuation and a fruition of everything that had come through from the time when I was very, very young. She doesn't look at becoming Catholic so much as a conversion, but rather a continuation. Because Jesus, after all, was Jewish. And that sense of continuation is the most beautiful thing. We don't just spontaneously um, emerge in life. I mean, we are the product of so much that's become before us. So I feel in some way that I can't even quite describe or um, get my head around that I'm part of some kind of very important continuation. So that was the sense that I had when I was called. I felt in myself this comp compulsion to be baptized. And Jessica is in the process of finishing her first book, which she has titled, In Duet with God, The Story of a Lifelong Friendship. Jessica is such a wonderful talent for helping anyone to be able to play and appreciate the piano. For more information about Jessica Romisher, you can find a link on our website at iobserve Dot org, where you can also find news on the church both in the Diocese of Springfield and around the world. That's iobserve.org. You've been watching a special encore edition of Real to Real. Please join me right back here next week for another encore edition of Real to Real, your window on the world around you when it could be snowing in parts of our program. We will take you back to February 22nd at Berkshire East Ski Resort in Charlemont. Until then, have a great week. Real to Real is a production of the Catholic Communications Corporation, funded in part by the annual Catholic Appeal, and the support of you, our faithful viewers.